Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the second panel discussion of the first Outing the Past virtual symposium. Um, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Um, we took a little bit of a break between um, our Heritage at Home session and this session to allow some of our friends and colleagues from the US to be part of this panel discussion. I'm Ken Valente, and I'm the conference coordinator for Outing the Past. And I wanted to just uh, take few, care of a few housekeeping details before I introduce Molly Merriman, who will be facilitating um, this afternoon's discussion. The sessions are being recorded. Uh, please watch the Outing the Past website for updates about the availability of the recordings. Um, we'll be putting links into the chat feed that will direct you to the Outing the Past website uh, in particular, the symposium website, and a few other uh, links that we think you might be interested in. We hope that you enjoy today's free event. And we've just launched a project to raise funds to support students, artists, and activists attending future conferences. Um, we hope you'll consider donating to that fund We'll provide a link again in the chat feed for that. But if you want to visit the site directly, it's crowdfunder.co.uk. And if you search the term either access or improving access, that should pull up our project. There'll probably be a few others that are brought to the fore, but ours will have the Outing the Past logo attached to it. It should be fairly easy to um, recognize. Um, Maisie Barker, who's the media and promotions coordinator for Outing the Past, is going to be monitoring the chat and question and answer feed today for us. And she'll provide some of the links to the Outing the Past site, contributors, biographies, and the crowdfunder website as we go forward. So thanks to Maisie for taking care of that. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Molly Merriman. Molly is the founding director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality Studies at Kent State University in Ohio in the United States. She's also the research director for Queer Britain, um, the UK's national LGBT plus history museum, where she leads the museum's virtually queer project. And together with Queer Britain, she's helping to launch a new project entitled Queer Pandemic, resilience in the time of crisis. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague, Molly Merriman, who will introduce our panelists and facilitate today's discussion. Thank you, Ken. And, and thank you to all of our participants, panelists, and attendees. I um, want to introduce our panel, which is creatively engaging with the LGBT plus past. And I'm so excited to, to be joined by so many talented and accomplished panelists, all of whom have uh, very interesting takes on, on the ways in which they engage LGBTQ history in creative endeavors. Um, I'm going to just give very quick, brief uh, descriptions of each individual um, in the interest of time. And, I highly encourage you to go to the Adding the Past website and, and look more thoroughly at, um, at the biographies and, and, and to even do some Googling because it's, it's just remarkable what every individual on, on this panel has, has accomplished. Um, we'll be moving in, in alphabetical order in, in the first question. And, um, and so just to uh, give you uh, an idea of who is joining us, we have Stephen Hornsby, who is a multi-award winning playwright and artistic director of Ink Brew Productions. Hilary McCollum is a writer and feminist activist whose debut novel, Gold Digger, won the Golden Crown Literary Society Award for Historical Fiction in 2016. Mac, Julia McNamara, is the artistic director of Vital Exposure, a London-based disability-led theater company Richard O'Leary is the coordinator of the Northern Ireland LGBT Heritage Project, which is funded by the UK Heritage Lottery Fund. 
Peter Scott Pressland has been active in LGBT theater since 1972 and formed the queer community theater companies One in Ten, Consenting Adults, and Homo Promos. And assistant professor Lauren Vachon teaches LGBTQ studies at Kent State University and has been involved with student-led theatrical, uh, theatrical productions. And, um, and so again, I, I highly encourage attendees to look at the, the longer bios and, and also to, to look into some of the works that all of these individuals have, have done. And what I want to do to start us off with is uh, to ask each individual to explain why you are interested in connecting uh, creatively to the LGBTQ past and, um, and, and to you know, briefly share some of, of how you are, are doing that. And so, um, Stephen, if you could start us off with this. You're still muted, Stephen. Yep. <laughs> First error. Um, so I, even more ambitiously, I'm now going to try and share my screen. So um, let's see how that goes. And then I'll kick off. So I'm clicking on the share screen button now and hopefully selecting the right thing um, and going from the beginning. If I could just get an audio um, or to say that yes that is working yes, you can, yeah i can see it mm, yeah terrific thank you um so i'm just going to run through some of my activity in the last five years um uh, which will give some context to my interest in dramatizing archives and exploring the past creatively and then i'm going to just raise some questions and issues that i'm grappling with as i'm writing a phd in um, how we write from archive for stage and screen. And hopefully that might act as some starter points for other people to come in with their own views and perceptions and lead us into some of the debates later on. So I joined LGBT History Month in 2014 and we did our first piece with them in 2015, which was called A Very Victorian Scandal and was the dramatization of some of Dr. Jeff Evans' research into the police raid on a drag ball in Manchester, human Manchester in 1880. And we recreated it in three episodes over three days. In 2017, this is just talking about my work. We've heard of earlier about Abby Hines' work in 2016 with um, the uh, uh, Mr. Stokes, the man with Manchester. Um, in 2017, um, again, I did a companion piece with Abby. So Abby wrote a piece called um, Burnley's Lesbian Liberator. I wrote the Burnley Buggers Ball. Burnley is a small mill town in Lancashire. And it was the center place where the first ever LGBT um, meeting happened in terms of trying to open a center. And Peter, who's with us today, had uh, written about that for his amiable, wonderful Warriors book. Um, and I used that and uh, my own kind of rooting around as the basis for an, a, a piece, an immersive piece of theatre and the library where the meeting happened still existed and had mothballed the original room, but reopened it for us, especially for the play. So that was a, a real treat. And you can see the images below from the original meeting and then above in the slide are actors in character recreating some of those key moments from the meeting itself. Then in 2019, I did um, a piece called The Adhesion of Love, which was a play about a group of working class men in Bolton, two of whom made it across the Atlantic um, into meeting Walt Whitman in the final years of his life and wrote a very detailed account, kind of travelogues and took pictures of their time with Walt. Also in 2019, I did the Museum Monologues project with Bolton. I wrote one piece and commissioned four other writers, one of whom was Abby, writing about Vesta Tilly. But we also had uh, Matt Cain um, dramatizing an 80s story, The Madonna of Bolton for us. You see the actor there recreating the Madonna pose that was in the museum. Uh, and then I was commissioned by Islington Museum to work with a group of young people. Uh, to create a piece called The No History of the Near Not Now um, about the destruction of history and archives and what they mean to young people today as um, the Islington Museum had just created their first LGBTQIA archives. 
And then finally, in 2019, which was the busiest year of my life, um, I wrote a piece called First Rumours, which was um, uh, as a result of being playwright in residence at the People's History Museum in Manchester, who hold some of uh, Peter Tatchell's archive. And I interviewed Peter for uh, six hours in addition to exploring the archival records they had of his time attempting to be a Labour MP in Bermondsey in 1983. I'll just come out of screen sharing now and come back. And for me, I could see, I felt I could see love between at least two of those women. But we have very little information about the lives of working class les lesbians in the early 20th century. Um, We've, we've lost the photos again. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm happy to be without them. Um, I'll, I'll, or I'll give it you back if you want. Um, this, I w I'm never sharing screens again. Um, so we don't know very much about the lives of working class women in that period. And for me, what I've been trying to work on in the novel is imagining what would it be like to be a young lesbian at that time, falling in love for the first time against the backdrop of the well of loneliness being published and then banned. Um, and so for me, it's what are the ethics around how I fill in the gaps of knowledge? And that's uh, a question I can't answer in the time now because I'm running out of time, but it's maybe something that we can come back to in the discussion because I'm very interested in the ethics of how you produce knowledge and how you invent into the gaps. So that'll be for me for now. Thank you. And uh, up next we have Mac. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Thanks for having me. It's a joy to be here. <laughs> to say I haven't eaten well today, but there we go. Um, I want to talk about staging female masculinities and uh, not least because I feel, and this is my stuff, of course, I haven't done enough research, that we are at risk of losing butch voices uh, from our histories. And then um, it feels crucial to me that we always look back to see where we've come from to honor our past before we can go forward. And I don't know any culture on earth that doesn't do that, you know. Um, I've spent seven years directing The Butch Monologues, which was written by Laura Bridgman, um, lovely writer. And we gathered between us now about 115 testimonies of people between the ages of 19 and 74. So there's a vast spectrum of stories, like a living archive that we've gathered now. We've published one collection of 54 stories, but we've been staging the presentations with people with lived experience of female masculinity, trans men, gender rebels, butch dykes, uh, all mask of center. And then um, all who responded to a call out to the butch experience. And of course, we've attracted people from America, from Australia, from Southeast Asia, from India, uh, from all over Europe. Um, most specifically, we've got a lot of stories from London. I've just lost my image, I knew that had happened. Um, and so people who responded to our call out for the Butch Monologues and people who uh, um, had lived the experience and still live the experience um, of female masculinity, we're excited by the idea of hearing their stories at last, hearing their voices at last on stage, uh, which is something we don't often hear. Now, we've been traveling seven years now. We've been all over the place touring this piece of work. And we now developed a model over the last four years of choosing local readers everywhere we go. So it's a completely different model. So they read script in hand. Um, I prefer five on stage. We have had seven when we did the, the WOW Festival at the Royal Festival Hall. Um, I just feel like in terms of the dramaturgy and the kind of emotional notes, if you like, of where we're taking the themes of those stories, um, you kind of miss a beat of the seven. It's just too cluttered for me anyway. So I like five. That's my favourite number. And we choose local readers who respond to a call out. I go out wherever we are 
ahead of time and do a couple of weeks with those local readers and get to know them and love them and um, bring the best that they can be out on stage when they're reading these stories. Everybody's required to read other people's stories. Sometimes if I shuffle them, they may be given their own. I've made it my business to keep every storyteller anonymous to me so that when I'm working with somebody on stage, um, I'm not projecting stuff or worrying too much about caretaking that person in the moment. And um, everybody in rehearsal is given an opportunity to opt out of stories they find too risky, um, that may trigger them in some way, or they don't agree with. Um, I always start the first rehearsal by doing a read through of whatever we've got in the collection. And I re-edit the collection every time we revisit a venue or we revisit the same festival, which we have done. We've done Homotopia twice, Shout twice, um, Wow Festival three times. Um, so yes, we re-edit the collection to keep it fresh. And so it's a completely different presentation every time we go. What excites me is what people come up with and teach us every time we come into a community about their experience, their lived experience of female masculinity or gender rebellion. And, um, and for me, I'm a self-identified butch dyke. I love the word dyke, uh, working class butch and happy. Here's some of the words that we bookend this piece with. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of loveliness with this one. Bro, big boy, bad boy, prince, King, butch, husbutch, brother boy, swagger, aggressive, agey, stone, stud, carant, daddy bear, mister, matcha, mask, masculine, master, man royale, dagger, dandy, daddy o, daddy, diesel, dom, daj, top, bro. That list takes us through um, the names people have for themselves in all of the cultural spaces we've been gathering these stories. It's one of the most exciting projects I've ever been engaged with. And uh, we're actually, we're back at it tomorrow at Queen Mary's um, filming the documentary of the making of the Butch Monologues. Um, what I love about it is I feel like we're contributing to keeping hold of voices that are gonna be part of an archive for future people coming through so that the butch experience is part of a plethora of possibilities in gender identities you know in our rainbow and uh, i love it that we're holding firm on butch lesbians in the middle there one of my favorite favorite um, prompts for me was look i was going to show you a slideshow but like hill i'm you know technical wizard superb um, so i'm not sharing no screen not even going there i'm not even pretending but here is i'm going to show you this picture one of my favorite images is of um, a Parisian cafe. It was a women's club. And this image was taken in 1960 when I was born, by the way. And uh, I know I, I look at least 80 these days after this bloody lockdown. But anyway, um, I love this image and I love what it says underneath as well. So this striking figure in her well-cut man's coat is Fried owner of the most fashionable and one of the most unusual nightclubs in Paris. All its members are women. They all wear masculine cut dress. I think they mean suits by that, by the way. Um, wide trousers. And their guests are mainly film celebrities. The beautiful club secretary, Michelle Berger, lights Frida's cigarette in this image here, taken in 1960. And who would say no, honestly? This is on the wall in my beloved partner's office over in Melbourne, now in a hideous lockdown. But um, I have to say, it still keeps my heart a flutter. <laughs> Be still my beating heart. I don't know whether I've gone over time, but... Um, Trust me, I can go on and on. So hold the reins, will you, Molly? You're, 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 you're definitely good. And uh, thank you. Everyone's been respecting the time quite well. Um, and uh, Richard, it's, uh, it's, it's your turn. Hi. Um, I came out as a performance storyteller four years ago. 
and I want to tell you how that came about. Uh, I came out as a gay man in 1988 and at college was a um, gay activist. But then I met my life partner who was an Anglican clergyman. This is Northern Ireland. And so I slid back into the closet, uh, which reminds people that sometimes in, in our biographies, it isn't all a trajectory of um, emancipation. Uh, and that was because he um, faced discrimination in his employment. Um, I had studied history as an undergrad, but to find a permanent academic job, I became a quantitative sociologist, positivist, uh, number cruncher. And I actually wrote my PhD, 100,000 words of it, on religious intermarriage, um, which um, was based entirely on data analysis and modeling. And even though I was actually in a religiously Catholic Protestant mixed relationship myself, I never disclosed that to my supervisor, who I don't think would have been affirming, but also I never used the word I in 100,000 words about um, Catholic Protestant um, um, intermarriage. And even at my PhD, Viva, uh, I was asked, oh, you know, why are you doing this topic? And I said, oh, it's intellectually very interesting. I didn't actually say that because I had personal insights to have been in a same sex uh, relationship. Um, and um, what changed was, um, my partner's illness brought around a situation where we found ourselves discriminated against by the state uh, and by um, employers. So for, we had to challenge that discrimination and that brought me back into to activism, um, uh, both in terms of legal challenges and uh, community um, activism. Um, it also meant as a carer, I ended up leaving academia and in 2016, when I had no longer any connection with my former employer, Queen's University Belfast, I had heard of LGBT History Month and as an individual was motivated to hold, with the help of a former colleague, a public lecture at Queen's University for LGBT History Month, which was advertised as a conventional lecture called The Fateful Underground, 40 Years of Gay Christian Activism in Northern Ireland. And on the night when I went to give that, what appeared to be conventional talk, I just decided I was gonna do it a different way, my own way, which actually was maybe an, an instinctive way. So at the outset of the lecture, I said, let's get the protest out of the way to begin with. Because I had as an activist experienced protest by Christian uh, opponents. So I made that part of my talk, my lecture. And I also brought in objects from my personal life and my campaigning, which have been part of um, my activism. And I enjoyed it and the audience enjoyed it such that I decided, you know, maybe I should take this approach again. Initially, I called it a performance lecture, but then um, as part of that year, 2016 outburst, Queer Arts Festival, I did a scratch performance in a small 30 seat theater and I did a piece called, There's a Bishop in My Bedroom. And I have what I wrote about it. I said, there's a bishop in my bedroom told by Dr. Richard O'Leary. There's only so much a person can take before they scream. There's a bishop in my bedroom and I want him out. And um, what I did is I appeared on stage and I just told my experiences um, of Christian homophobia, uh, of which of course bishops are, are among the characters. And then um, Tinderbox Theatre Company saw it and um, I was elevated to the Mac Theatre in Belfast. Um, for someone who's never been on stage before and I'm not an actor, this was quite daunting, but I was a thrill to have my own dressing room. And um, the blurb for the show says, Traditional Irish storytelling meets folk theatre to take on sex education, sourcing illegal condoms in 90s Dublin, falling in love, religiously mixed and same-sex relationships, 
and facing the realities of end of life care. Now, um, on stage, I did not leave behind my academic background, which was very empirical. So I didn't have the issue also of permission to tell a story because I was telling my own story. And also everything I said was evidence-based. So when I was telling a story, which is quite dramatic about um, um, the um, Anglican bishop, you know, um, discriminating against us, I would have produced the actual letter which would have come through our door and I would have read out that letter. So there's a mixture of documentary material, but it's my own documentary material and some of this of historical significance, but it's part of my own personal archive. And similarly, when I appeared on stage and told about my own secret on the ground commitment ceremony, at a time when there was no civil partnership, and it was only shortly after a decriminalization, I would have worn the jacket, this jacket, that I had worn on the day of my own private underground commitment ceremony. Um, and I would have used you know, personal objects like my, 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 my jewelry. So my performance has that combination of the hyper-personal, because I'm drawing on my own domestic um, archive, um, but also it's historically robust insofar as all documents are um, you know, original and can be verified and will be uh, you know, lodged eventually into, into an archive. So in that sense, I'm also contributing. And one of the reasons this is so important is because um, so often our histories are dismissed. And I do feel that there is an advantage for me as a performance storyteller to say, you can't deny this story not only because I'm telling it, but also I have the evidence to prove and show up often other people's bad behavior. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Peter, it's, it's uh, your turn to speak. Hello there. Uh, I have a notorious uh, tendency to overrun, so please shut me up when I get to my seven minutes and I will just stop abruptly and anything else can happen in a question and answer. I wrote my first gay song six months after I came out in May 1972 and that song was called We Were In There and it was a song about gay history. It was about the only bits that we knew at that stage and mostly it was about men. Uh, it was about the wild trial, it was about the 1930s in Nazi Germany and it was about the Stonewall riot. Obviously that involved trans as well. So three periods of history. We, I did it because I felt a sense of the past was a very important part of my sense of identity. I needed a sense of continuity, bearing in mind that we had no family, immediate family that we belonged to. We had no geographical community that we belonged to. History was where our community was. Um, and that was for several pur purposes. We needed heroes, heroines, we need, and martyrs. We needed to reclaim lost figures, which is one of the reasons I still do uh, LGBT history in drama form. Um, I want to reclaim Robert Reed, who was a great 1930s activist, the first person who stood up and said, I am homosexual and what we, I want first person is, which was an extremely brave thing to do at the start of the war. Uh, there was a woman called Meg Atkins who went around um, hectoring, not hectoring, tackling um, HR people on the old Trafford, on the Trafford estate. Uh, she went around this really grimy, grubby estate, dressed almost like Audrey Hepburn uh, in picture hats and long gloves and tackled the HR people about this. Um, two years ago, I did a play called The Keyhole which was the story of the uh, arrest and trial and the hanging of the last two men to be hung for som sodomy in this country. I found the house where they were arrested in, in Southwark, just behind Blackfriars, and we did it outside the house and put candles and flowers outside afterwards in front of the uh, mayor of Southwark. So that was a, a bit of an advance from the original situation. Um, at the time when I first started writing, all gay plays, and they were all called gay, whether they were about lesbians or gay, uh, gay men, they were, uh, all gay plays had to be the gay play. Uh, they had to say everything that there was to be said about, about the gay situation. They had to be relentlessly positive, relentlessly upbeat, 
because we needed role models in the days of John Inman, Dick Emery, etc., etc. Um, over time, things have become a lot more nuanced, I think, and we don't need to affirm in that very simplistic sense um, in the way that we did. Um, it ties in what I do for history with the purpose of lesbian and gay theatre, LGBT theatre in general. It's about education, it's about discovery, it's about celebration, it's about satire, uh, but it's also an interrogation of values. To use the past as a vehicle um, for the illustration of issues, bones of contention, things we don't feel very comfortable with. And then the past can be a safe space to do that, uh, in, in, in a, where in a contemporary situation, it can be fraught with difficulty. Uh, there are two views of the past, I think. One is the, the Lucy Worsley school, the, the theatre as a dressing up box. Basically, the people in the past are the same as people are now, except they happen to wear these rather lovely but funny clothes. Um, the other view is to say people actually of their time are deeply strange to us. They're very different. And the challenge is to actually get into that, into that mind. Uh, and that's what I'm drawn to, the strangeness of people. Um, you know, we talk about well, L.P. Hartley's uh, cliche, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And, and that is what interests me as a person. I'm interested in that, I'm interested in coincidence, I'm interested in juxtaposition, the way values are handed down and change from generation to generation. And at the heart of that concern is language because people in plays are what they say. I don't know how many of you have seen historical dramas and you've heard dialogue with, they, they wouldn't have said that. That's, that's not the right language. Um, and so a lot of my time when I'm writing, I actually spend looking through etymological dictionaries. I'm doing at the moment a revisionist uh, interpretation of Jekyll and Hyde. And the other day I wanted to use the phrase sellout. And I thought 1885, sellout? Sounds a bit modern. So I went to a dictionary and actually it's an Americanism that came in in the 1850s. So, so I was OK uh, with that one. We also need to remember when we if you're going that view of history, that LGBT people always work within the limits of what was possible for them at the time. Uh, what, what events made possible, what language makes possible, what the ideas around at the time make possible. In my, in my work, uh, The Gay Century, which is a cycle of 17 uh, one-act operas, the third episode, A Helping Hand, um, concerns the meeting of E.M. Forster and, um, and Edward Carpenter in, in 1912. Um, and Carpenter forces Forster to say at one point, I am an unspeakable of the Oscar Wilde sort. Now, in modern terms, that is profoundly self-oppressive and deeply disturbing. But in terms of the time and this incredibly closeted, um, constipated, emotionally constipated man, Forster, it was a huge step forward. It was, it was the beginning of a long journey for coming out and acceptance. So going with all this, I think we, th we see heroism as, as, as a series of small steps. It's very incremental and we have to celebrate the small in a lot of this. So I'll just go over to the, the gay century. It's a cycle of 17 operas. I started with the concept of writing one for every decade of the 20th century. I've ended up with 17. So there are more, there are more than, well, the 80s has four, for example. Um, we're doing it with seven key, key people, which a maximum of seven, which is, includes the, the instrumentalists, the orchestra as well. So it's actually a perfect piece for coronavirus times. It, it really is. And I'm really hoping to get some, some of them on in, uh, in that idea. And you try and find odd angles to familiar events. Play, plays and playwriting is about playfulness. And it's actually what I'm into is playfulness with history. Uh, there's an old journalistic saying, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And I say, never let the facts get in the way of a good play. Um, so th the thing opens with Victoria and Oscar Wilde. Victoria visiting Wilde on his deathbed. Um, and it's a kind of dialogue, a Hege Hegelian thesis, antithesis, which actually sets up a framework for the whole century, uh, which is between repression and liberation and it goes right the way through the whole cycle the last one which is set in Marsham House in 2001 for the first experimental gay civil partnerships in this country there is a portrait of Queen Victoria on the wall in the in the official registrar's think time okay and by the end the, the portrait has been removed and the portrait of Oscar Wilde is there instead I'll shut up thank you 
Thank you, Peter. <laughs> and uh, finally, we're going to hear from Lauren. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can see and hear me. Um, I'm Assistant Professor Lauren Vashan. I teach at Kent State University um, here in America. I think, obviously, I'm American. <laughs> um, so my connection to the topic that we are all discussing today is that um, I, along with another faculty member here at my university, um, sort of created a drama piece called Stonewall Plus 50, The Riot Continues. And this was intended to mark the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising here in America. So our idea was that we would have the students devise, create, write, um, and perform this piece about um, the, the, the Stonewall Uprising and um, sort of like marking the 50th anniversary of it. So um, I'm gonna take just a little minute to, since I don't really know who's in our audience today, um, to explain um, the Stonewall Uprising. Um, so in June, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in New York City, um, that was a bar, um, a group of queer people um, stood up sort of like tired of being perpetually um, harassed by police, um, arrested, beaten, et cetera. Um, these patrons of the Stonewall Inn on this particular night um, fought back. They were tired of it and they fought back. There were three nights of violence um, and the police were actually quite taken aback and rather defeated by this. They weren't prepared for such an uprising. So in a way it was, um, the police were held back, it was relatively successful. Um, this was not the first queer uprising in America against police, um, but it spawned the first um, gay pride march. And so because of that, um, a gay pride march that commemorated that uprising, um, and because we now celebrate Pride Month every June, um, Stonewall has been a very memorable and critically important part of um, American queer history. Um, so the Stonewall um, Plus 50 Drama Project, um, it used a variety of means to tell the story. Um, and everything that came out of the devising of the piece was student-led. Um, we had a graduate student who um, did dance and choreography and she choreographed um, the uprising itself. It was depicted via dance um, and it was a really powerful moving um, part of the performance. Um, the students decided the way they wanted to tell the story after Stonewall was to sort of like have scenes that depicted different decades. And so they wrote scenes about each decade between Stonewall and 2019. So um, again, this meant that the students had to dig into history. Um, the students had to decide how to best summarize a whole decade of queer um, activism um, in a scene, a single scene, and that was quite a challenge for many of the decades, as some of you, um, I'm sure, understand. There's, you know, been a lot that has happened. So the students, it was up to them to decide how to depict each decade, um, and different students wrote different scenes. Um, so I felt that this was a really powerful way for the students to connect with history, and that's been one of my interests, um, I think, as a person who um, my degree is a creative writing degree, um, I teach students, I'm always trying to invite them into some kind of creative process. Um, I really strive to have my students do um, the work themselves. Like I don't wanna show them things. I don't wanna talk to them about things. Um, something else that I do that is history related, um, I teach an LGBTQ research methods course and I teach students how to um, collect oral history interviews and then send them out to collect oral history interviews from LGBT people here um, in my, my, our own community. So I'm always looking for ways to have students learn by doing and learn by creating. Um, definitely this is like just part of who I am as a, as a, as a professor. Um, students bring so much to the table for me that like, I, I, I couldn't have imagined if I would have tried to create um, a Stonewall project by myself, it would have been uh, nothing like what the students did. And what the students did was incredibly, enormously moving. 
and powerful. Um, another interest of mine in terms of um, sort of like engaging with the past is um, this idea of sort of like audience or viewer or reader like response. Like how can we engage with the people who are gonna read what we write or view our plays, um, et cetera. And so for the Stonewall plus 50 piece, um, when I brought that idea to the students, um, they came up with this idea that they wanted audience feedback in some kind of like tangible way. So as the audience filed into the theater, we handed each audience member a pencil and a post-it note. And we asked them to describe their uprising on this pencil post-it note and then turn it into us. And so essentially, um, the what's your uprising post-it notes are like more fuel for me um, for like art and and creativity because um, what the audience members wrote as their own personal uprisings were um, powerful like brought me to tears in some cases um, so these are some of the ways that I've like engaged with this idea of bringing queer history to the forefront um, and yeah I think I'm done <laughs> thank you Thank you, Lauren. And um, for for our next uh, stage of of um, uh, of the panel, now that we've heard from from each individual, we're we're going to shift into uh, where everyone can step in, or just a couple of people can step in to to answer some questions. And I I, I I'm really struck by how each of you has. Um, in many ways, very different processes and, and, and very different ways of, of approaching history. And I, I think, and I, I've noticed in, in looking at the attendee list, we, we, we do have um, uh, several historians that, that, that are in the audience. And, and I think, you know, a, a question that, that often arises when we're doing creative interpretations of historical evidence, historical facts, historical stories, is um, where do each of you draw the line as, as to where um, historical accuracy ends and creativity begins? And what do you each think is the, the ethical responsibility you have as, as scholars and creators uh, to maintain a certain truth? And, and particularly with that, um, you know, some of you have spoken to um, telling stories of people who are often absent in in the historical record and and so you know again what is your obligation to um to to create um a historical uh truth and 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 not necessarily um historical accuracy in in telling that story a kind of that's sort of start to touch around this and I guess different writers have different approaches to it I mean I'd largely try and not change facts if if I can sometimes it will condense things um sometimes instead of 20 people being involved in doing that there's only four or five because especially with the, with a the novel I mean I guess with theatre as well you, you can't have you can't have too big a cast the reader can't can't get to grips with it. So for me, I kind of largely stick within the facts. Um, but it is for me very much this thing about, is this plausible or at least possible? In Given what we know about that time period and what were the expectations of women, what was the room for maneuver for poor people, is what I'm writing at least a possible way of understanding what we know about that time period and how people might have lived their lives in, in that, that space. I read Emma Donoghue's historical fiction and I like that she will often include, well pretty much always includes um, like an afterword where she outlines what what, what's the facts and what's not. And I, I didn't do that with Gold Digger partly because really, you know, as I said, there was no evidence of, there was no <laughs> evidence at all in relation to lesbian lives. Um, but uh, I've got a suffragette novel, which will hopefully be out next year. And I will certainly be, be outlining that. And with As a Lover, I will also be outlining 
um, some of that because as a lover has got imaginary characters and it's got real life people. And I think there's also ethics about how do you represent real historical figures. So I, uh, I think somebody else has picked up on the issue of Ammonite, which is coming out soon. And um, while there's not definitive um, proof that, um, that that character whose name I can't remember off the top of my head actually did have sexual relationships with women. But that's the trouble with, I think, lesbian lives in particular. You know, I call it the um, smoking dildo test. You know, we haven't got you know, how many people have kept, okay, Roger Casement mistakenly kept a very detailed diary of all his sexual encounters with men, which is why the British were able to hang him so easily. But most of us don't have, haven't kept accurate records of every time we had sex with somebody. Uh, and therefore, am I just going to be put down as a spinster in the future? You know, had a very close friendship. No so I think we... <laughs> I know, I don't think so. But I mean, and I guess partly because we are all, we're able to be out now. But I, I think, I think for me, it's about how do you accrue evidence? And why do you feel like, what is it that's suggestive? So with the suffragettes, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of evidence that Christabel Pankhurst had definitely romantic relationships with women. Now, we'll never be able to prove whether they're sexual or not. And then I think you've got scope as a writer to say, okay, this is what we do know. And I'm, I'm then imagining beyond that. I mean, just to build on that, really, I think, I think in terms of the ethics, um, we've been written out. Let's spend the next hundred years writing ourselves in everywhere and not give a toss about whether that's overwriting it or not. <laughs> I think we've got permission to push back, and if we overcompensate a little along the way, well, then fair enough. Um, I, the, th the thing I've experienced most, and it's a very simple idea that makes me realise how a lot of history is nothing more than an elaborated story. And I, I, I have the contention that as soon as you dramatise history, you change history. And I think that functions at lots of different levels. It's often in the research that you do, you come to different conclusions to what the established narrative histories are. I think once you do a show, and you've got, you know, if your publicity has been any good, then, then the searchable history becomes different. So when people Google things, I'm conscious that what happens now is they get images, uh, you know, if, if they're looking at Burnley in 1971, the first thing that comes up is the images from the show, not the actual images of the meeting. So you enter this kind of weird world in which the technology privileges the creative um, uh, expressions of the past over the actual historical documents and so I think the thing everything I've learned about in the last five years of doing this work is that most of history is incredibly selective that the past is just a massive chaos of events and that any narrative we impose upon it from any perspective afterwards is entirely subjective provisional and made up so why shouldn't our voice be as loud as anybody else's Thank you. Richard, I saw your hand go up and then Peter. I think I come from a very different approach to many of the other contributors because I do actually start with um, historical documents and the challenge for me is how do I make this engaging for an audience? Um, you know, how can I maybe um, make it a bit more entertaining or, or dramatic? I mean, a dry letter from a bishop might not be very good material for theatre unless you approach it in a particular way. Now I've done that through um, putting the context of you know, autobiographical story but one of the things which um, has helped is by being a live performer and I've resisted putting scripts having them published is that I can repeat that performance at a later point and I can feel different about my experience and I can maybe change some of the content. And in that sense, there's a great freedom of being able to rewrite history in light of later reflections or even new material. So uh, for me, um, the link between history and the creative is very much through the live performance, which is never a finished product. 
Thank you. And Peter? I just wanted to endorse what Sir Stephen said, because I think we are faced with multiple narratives always, um, and any number of them could be plausible. And I think our primary duty in terms of historical accuracy is to do no harm, like doctors, um, to, uh, to, to, to not do violence to the known facts, however we interpret them, whatever else we add to them, um, and, and, and to create our, our, our thing out of that. I wouldn't go along with Richard from my point of view, because as a creative playwright, the, the, the most important thing to me is the object, the play, at the, at the, at the end. Um, and how it speaks to an audience and what it says says to them. Um, the other thing, of course, that happens is that interpretations change over over many years. I mean, there's a correspondence going on in, in the chat about uh, the Stonewall riots and who was involved, yes. And obviously now we are much more aware of the diversity of the people who are involved. But if you go back 50 years, well, not 50 years, it's only just 50 years old, say 48 years, um, the narrative was that it was gay men at that time and that's what it was seen as and obviously we're constantly modifying things and we're modifying it partly through what we discover from records and archives and, and personal testimonies and partly through what we make up and interpret ourselves it's a combination and interaction between the two great um, we have a question from the audience and uh and the question is to what extent do panelists think that those of us who don't identify as LGBT plus are a hindrance to advocating for creative recognition of and support for LGBT plus activities? Is it a matter of personal authenticity? Peter. Um, I think the concept of straight allies, if I can use that as a shorthand, is extremely useful. If you go back through um, the history of our, our advances um, through the last hundred years, a lot of the time we have been aided, supported, and in sometimes goaded um, by straight allies. Um, and I think to, um, to deny that involvement is um it's a historically inaccurate um and and b very unhelpful anyone else want to jump in on this question oh, yeah. on um i mean our lgbt heritage project um we have encouraged the involvement of people who would not identify as lgbt and also we seek to celebrate the lives of lgbt allies so um, the notion that only we could write our history or that only we could be interested in history um, would be very far away from certainly the, the thinking in, on our project. And um, obviously um, that can apply to other groups as well in terms of intersectionality and, and, and solidarity. Excellent point. Anyone else wanna add to that question? Okay, um, what, what I want to ask next is um, that, you know, when we look at, um, you know, we, we were just speaking of, of how there's been, for example, an evolution of understanding about uh, Stonewall and, and that, you know, we have gotten more expansive in um, who we acknowledge, how we acknowledge diversity, um, but what do you think are in in the current moment and and perhaps um, anticipating a near future uh, what would be the contested areas that we would see in a creative retelling of lgbtq plus histories Mac. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, we're all afraid of conflict and what could be contentious, but actually I spent two years of my life on one of the most exciting projects, um, milling around the ethical dilemmas of medical museums. Um, so I'm less fearful now. Uh, 
I would say that we're still going to worry about how we embody um, the person that threw the first stone. Um, I hated seeing it turn into a white gay man when I saw um, a kind of fanciful film about that footage, um, about what happened. And we know that Storm de la Vere was um, certainly living as a Butch Dyke at the time. I'm not sure that would have been her self-identity. Um, who then apparently became trans. I don't know what the reality is. I wasn't there and I don't know who was. And from some of the stories being reframed and retold, I feel like um, there's a conceit we have really when we're doing the retelling. Whose side are we going to claim? You know, was that person a butch dyke? Was that person trans? They were quite clearly a person of colour, which actually I have to say, given my history as a white working class butch who's done all of that anti-racism kind of um, the struggle the struggle and coming from a mixed blended family now I loathe using person of colour but um, language changes so I'm going with people's self-identification but I do think there's going to be challenges to how do we stage this um, we have to be very respectful we're the custodians of other people's life stories and fragments we only have you know we don't have the full story. Those people are not here to say, I'm all right with that. If you want to call me that, that's fine. If that feels safe for you, if that feels colorful, if that's going to bring bums on seats, if that's going to make sure you sell this work and we get the voices out there, that's fine. Claim me, I'm yours. So I think there'll be lots of different places where, you know, there may be conflict about how we embody that person on stage. Whose body do we use? And then, um, be really interesting to see where you could go <laughs> because it could be somebody completely gender fluid who starts the play is a butch dyke and then at the end of the play they're trans or non-binary or gender fluid entirely now that would be wacky but fun and they threw the first brick that's the most important thing i think also that i think one of the things for the for the future is i guess for me trying to get away from the idea that, and I work in, in fiction, so historical fiction, but I guess the same true for drama, that it's all fiction and no history, um, which I think is where uh, certainly parts of uh, traditional history have come from. Well, you know, it's all very, that's fine for entertainment. And I, I would like to have greater recognition of the power of um, creative writing to contribute knowledge um and that, as i said before it's pro it's provisional knowledge but it's knowledge that can be assessed against other accounts um to, to consider whether it's at least a possible understanding so I, I suppose that's one of the things i would like greater recognition that um that what we're doing in in telling stories of the past that actually aren't in recorded history what we're doing is is creating knowledge and that it's valid knowledge. And that actually, even with parts that are in recorded history, that still, you know, you can get a different slant on it by coming at it creatively. And there's so many, I don't know if people know what she called them, um, Laura DeForce Gordon, I think her name was. Anyway, there was a woman in, um, there was a time capsule opened in um, San Francisco, I think in the 70s, and it had been buried 100 years uh, previously. And there was a, botany book in, in the time capsule and it had been put in by a woman who was uh, active in the suffrage struggle um, the early suffrage struggle but also was a botanist and drew pictures of plants and she'd written in the flyleaf I want it known that the author was a lover of her own sex now so we've now got that as part of recorded history but how you would go back and understand that you're not really probably going to get very much more necessarily from recorded history to try and think, okay, what was, what was going on for her? And why did she decide to do that? And who was she hiding it from? And how did she sneak the book in there? And all of that, that's only, you're only going to get that story by creatively imagining it. And it's not going to be, this is definitely what happened, but it's, this is what could have happened. And that still tells us something about what it might have been like to be same-sex attracted at that time in America. Thank you for that. Um, we we have a an, another question from the audience that 
is really interested in in teasing out um, that um, that gap be, between um, known history and um, and as as you know Stephen had called it ripe silences and what what this um, person is wanting to know is is they're saying that there's a, a higher threshold of truth required for telling LGBTQ plus stories in heritage settings. And um, how do we challenge this need uh, for a smoking gun and um, fill those silences and provide representation in heritage settings without evidence, um, you know, and evidence that may have been destroyed or, or never existed? How do we navigate that and, and ensure that we're representing accurately? Lauren? There we go. I'm unmuting. Okay. Um, hi. So I really think there, there was a comment in the um, chat over here that really got me thinking. And that comment was, we don't seem, well, I'm paraphrasing, but part of the comment was like, we don't seem to have a problem assuming someone was straight or cis in history. We don't have a problem with assigning those labels to historical figures. So if we then have a problem with assigning other identity labels or um, queer sexual, you know, behaviors to them that, you know, to me, it's like, I want to flip that question and say, like, why is it okay to assume everyone in history was cis and straight? Um, because I, I think like, we get so afraid to like, you know, I can't, I don't have evidence for this, I can't say that. And, and I feel like um, we should be able to be imaginatively bolder, um, especially if a work is a creative work. Um, it's not the same as a history, you know, book or something that's, you know, archival. So I think that's my point. That, that's all I wanted to say was just that, like, um, we never have a problem assuming somebody is cis or straight. So um, I just wanted to flip that. Yeah, and with that in mind, and and, and still connected to this question, um, someone in the chat, um, you know just throughout that, um, you know, can, can we abandon empirical knowledge as the highest achievement and instead stage conversations with the past? Can we queer what counts as knowledge? Yeah, I think the, um, with the project I did, um, the adhesion of love, just to give a bit of context, um, I was working with Bolton Museum who had a, at that point, talked about um, strong friendships in their account of the men that I was um, dramatizing. And also with the wonderful Bolton Socialist Club, who had um, been the kind of keepers of the flame for many decades of a sort of annual celebration of Walt Whitman's birthday, and who acknowledged some hints of the sexuality of the past, but we're taking a very kind of historical documentary driven approach as to what we could or couldn't say about them. So I think to both groups, I was a little bit challenging coming in and saying, flipping it like, like, like I think Lauren was saying, into saying, if we look at these guys' lives as primarily heterosexual, we are left with a series of puzzles and absences and we can't really explain some motivations. But if we just flip all of them over, and assume that they were sexually and emotionally interested in each other, then suddenly all the puzzles disappear from the historical record as to what they were motivated by at what point. So why don't we just start in the opposite position and not have the puzzles? Because that seems like a much simpler way of approaching who these people were. And actually, you know, the, the museum and, you know, certain historians are always going to want to revert back to that empirical document driven but is there evidence approach? And I think that my, my counter to that is, well, we're looking at the pattern of someone's life and we have to look at the motivations, the likely motivations for the big actions that they took for why they were obsessed with certain people at certain points and turn them into heroes. What was it was speaking to them in a reasonable, you know, I, I totally agree with Peter that we, you know, we, we are psychologically constructed in the moment all the time, and you can't just read how we are now into the past. But broadly, love, anger, fear, hate, you know, the big motivations in our life, they're going to remain consistent if differently expressed in different social constructs. And 
why create maps of people's lives that start from the the thing that explains least about what they did why not start from a set of assumptions that explain the most like you know leave you with the least gaps and absences and seem to connect up suddenly all these bits about how they did and i understand for museums it's a difficult balance and bolton did a wonderful job you know of with these museum monologues they allowed us to perform in gallery to schools groups to uh, groups of councillors you know we were right across the spectrum in terms of who that work went to and it did push a re the reads of those people further than perhaps the kind of authorial convention more conventionally historical readings in the in the labels did but i think they were able to hold both in tension with each other and and have an open conversation with the community about that and about why there are different levels of knowledge and I think they were a really good example of how to do that and how other museums and heritage sites might approach those kinds of conflicts. Bring in the creatives to express that, whether it's in written form, film or staging, and have that debate about how, you know, it, it's a really interesting ground for people to say, well, how do you know what this label says is true? And they can have a really interesting engagement about it. Uh, to Stephen and the questioner, I'd say, Yes, we can embrace the imagination. Yes, we can adopt the query of knowledge, but we need to be aware of what the consequences are of that. And it's, I'm not just thinking of the position of conventional historians here. I'm also speaking as an activist. Mm. Because if you're an activist, and I consider myself to be an activist and not just a historian and an artist performer, one of the outcomes I want is persuasion to... Um, bring people to 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 see things in, in, in a different way and i know that empirical material is effective in doing that for many people mm -hmm. so i will tend to make a choice as an activist to incorporate some material which i know is damning evidence rather than embrace something which is imaginative but which may not have the same impact on a certain section of the population who i know that empirical material means they just cannot yeah, so easily dismiss the story that I am trying to, um, to uh, present to them. Thank you for that. And um, in, in the interest of time and the, the need to have announcements at the end, um, there's one last question that, that, that I want to throw out there, um, which I think is a, a fitting theme to, to close on which is that looking to the future, how did the panelists propose we educate people on and commemorate queer history so that it is empowering and beneficial to queer people's understanding of their queer identity? I think we need multiple things. You know, one of the things that uh, the Outburst Festival a couple of years ago was a walking tour. You had headphones and you walked around Belfast and it had um, it had testimonies of people's experience of uh, HIV, and you'd you'd you had a guide, and it you, you know it was all self guided. It would tell you walk to this bit, and then you'd listen to a little bit of um, narrative about somebody talking about their experience of of HIV, and, and novels, obviously films. The I mean, I think we can't really have enough of it. We've got to go for multiple things in multiple ways. And part of it's about getting us into mainstream history as well as telling our LGBT history. So Alan Turing, I guess, is a kind of classical example. You know, he's, his story is about getting gay people into mainstream history. It's not just about gay history, but it's also about gay history because it's about how he was chemically castrated and why that led to his suicide. So, yeah, I think we just have to be all out, all over the place, all over everything. Go at it. <laughs> I think that's a, a great note to end on. And um, I, I want to uh, again thank our esteemed panelists. This has just been so vibrant and, and fun. And, <laughs> and I, I thank you for, for sharing your your supreme knowledge and and experiences with with all of us thank you very much and ken you would like to um have some some time for some closing um announcements yeah just as uh, thank you all I'm, i may appear in the shadows in this room i'm sorry for that but i 
feel truly enlightened by this panel and, and the earlier panel. And I wanted to just join up a couple of um, common threads between those two, the concern about ethics, how we do this, uh, doing it with integrity, doing it so that it does no harm, but nonetheless, we're doing it. Um, the idea that um, perhaps it's, it's a moment where, I'm, I'm, I'm now paraphrasing one of the panelists from earlier in the day, Chloe Chapman, um, you know, are we at a place now where we're disrupting a kind of narrative that relied on acts of heroism and myth-making, if you will, and moving to those small acts of humanity, the everyday. Um, and, and I, with my own students, I like to get them to think about activism as in some sense, just getting through the day, just being authentic in the world. So this, this kind of decentering, perhaps, or disrupting a kind of narrative. A greater recognition of creative writing, I think, Hillary, I, I, I want to echo that again in any kind of creative practice. Um, how do we make a space for that? And maybe that's a kind of collaborative space. Maybe it's um, the space where historians and creatives and others come together to produce a new kind of knowledge, I think, along the lines of the attendees' comments, so that we're, we're, we're asking bigger questions and we're thinking about how we queer how knowledge is produced and shared. So thank you all. Um, this has been terrific. It has been a wonderful stage setting event. All three parts of the symposium today have been a wonderful stage setting event for completing the past, which I will work diligently to make happen in 2021. I can't guarantee the platform. I can't guarantee the space, but I want us to all come together again to, to talk further, <laughs> thanks Mac, and talk more about these, these concerns and, and to really uh, have a, a greater opportunity for dialogue. Everyone should be presented with a survey as the session ends. It would be wonderful to have your feedback. Um, and I'm just going to say, you know, one more appeal for everyone to stay in touch with the Outing the Past website. Um, watch it for updates about the recordings of all three sessions. And also remember that we have a crowdfunder uh, project underway. You can check it out at crowdfunder.co.uk and either search access or improving access. Ah, Maisie, thank you for just putting that in the chat for us. So I look forward to seeing you all again. It would, I hope in person, but we're going to to keep working at making this happen one way or the other. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for attending. It's been wonderful to see you. Watch Adding the Past. Look out for LGBT plus History Month events that are launching in November uh, as a, the, the launch for LGBT plus History Month is in November with events uh, being scheduled for February. Thank you, Molly. Thank, thank you all. So just before we leave, just to remind everyone that um, for next presentations for next year's Outing the Past, I know we've just had this one, so it seems kind of short notice, but uh, if you go on the Outing the Past website, there is um, information there on how you can submit your presentations for 2021. As of yet, we still don't know whether it's going to be in this form or if it's in person, but please, we still want to hear all your history and what we have to say. Thanks, Maisie. Thank you, Molly, Mac, Stephen, Lauren, Peter, Richard, Hillary. Thank you all. And that's all from us. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Molly. <laughs>